If change is the only constant, then flexibility is the only response. So what do you do when all hell breaks loose? Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM, which combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. And if you're liking the show, I would love it if you'd buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. See the show notes for details. And now, let's get on with the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for being here. Today is another episode of the Speak From Within audiobook. If you are interested in learning how to engage, motivate, inspire, and excite your audience with your body, your voice, and your mission, this is the episode for you. I am going through every week and have been for the last few months and actually reading you the book on Thursdays. You can get the entire audio book of the book by joining us every Thursday and learning about how to speak from within. So what am I doing here today? I'm going to read you the next chapter. And something I should let you know is that once this chapter is read, once the book is read, I'll be removing the podcast episodes from the podcast. They won't be available anywhere but on my website in audiobook form. I'm doing this because I want to get the audiobook done. I'll be very, <laughs> be very honest. So if you want to listen to it for free right now, listen every Thursday. After the book is done, which should be in about five weeks, the podcast itself, uh, the episodes themselves are going away. So you'll only be able to get them off the website at isoldat.com. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM, and it is a fabulous app that allows you to do so many wonderful things, to meditate, to sleep, to get creative work done, to get admin work done, which is really hard for me. So I love the app for that. You can do any number of different things with the app to get to, to, to use your brain in new and cool ways, it's it combines neuroscience and music, and I love it. So I hope that you enjoy the app. If you want to try it, you can get 20% off. You can try it for free at Brain FM. Brain, I keep doing this, brain.fm slash innovative mindset. And you can get 20% off if you decide to buy it, try it. If you use the code innovative mindset, all one word. All the links for that are in the the show notes as well. If you want to support the podcast, you can buy me a cup of coffee. And the link for that is in the show notes as well. Buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. I'd love it if you chose support that way. It would mean the world to me uh, to know that you care enough about the podcast to support keeping it going. All right, here we go from Speak From Within. Chapter 16, The Wrench in the Works. If change is the only constant, then flexibility is the only response. So what do you do when all hell breaks loose? When the sound system doesn't work, the projector conks out and you're losing the audience by twos and threes, or you get heckled, or you lose your voice, or you've prepared one presentation, but it turns out they want something else entirely. What do you do when the entire event throws you nothing but flaming curveballs? I've been thinking about the importance of flexibility and responsiveness in life and in business. Life does throw us flaming curveballs. Business probably throws them just as often. We must adapt to new situations, needs, and challenges, and when that happens, it's best to be maneuverable. We must be willing to step outside our comfort zones and think of innovative ways to get past our challenges because, let's face it, it's not like the curveballs are going to stop coming. So what do we do? How do we deal with the gates of hell bursting open? If something goes wrong, don't react, respond. First, I'd say get a bird's eye view of the situation. Find a bit of distance and assess the extent of the damage. Then, of course, figure out who can solve the problem if you can't. You can't account for every eventuality, but you can plan for most. For example, when I'm speaking, I always travel with my own sound system, cables, computer, two thumb drives that contain my notes and presentation, and my own projector, just in case the client's tech blows up. I don't rely on the client to have everything ready. I am particular about my setup, down to where I want my bottle of water to sit while I speak. 
Don't use the glass if you can at all help it, by the way. They spill and they break. Instead, bring your own refillable bottle with an easy open spout so you can grab a swig without affecting the flow of your speech too much. Some might say this level of prep is overkill. But I know it saved me on multiple occasions when the client's equipment malfunctioned. But there are a lot of things that will be outside your control. All you can do is control how you respond to them. Hecklers. Oh boy, hecklers. They're so fun. Before I go any further, please note there is a difference between someone who genuinely disagrees and wants to debate you on a topic and a heckler. Someone who has a valid point might warrant a small deviation from your plan. I've stopped a speech to listen and ask a few questions when someone knowledgeable raises an issue. When I don't know the answer to the question they raise, frankly, I say so. And if time allows, I offer to research the point and come back with an answer. Or I offer to research it and send out a reply to anyone in the room who wants it. Valid points of view can make for a rich and energetic discussion, and that can elevate communication to inspiring heights. I never mind those sorts of interjections. Hecklers, on the other hand, are a different story. On the rare occasions when a member of my audience heckles me, I fall back on those perception and listening skills we've been practicing. I ask myself, why? What is making that person raise a fuss? Usually, they want to prove their intelligence or they want to spend a little time in the limelight. So I give it to them. I let them have the spotlight. I celebrate how smart they are for a few seconds. I thank them for bringing up such a fascinating point, And then I move on confidently. Feel free to acknowledge a heckler's viewpoint, but don't take too much time or feed them too much energy. Move along as quickly as possible. More importantly, maintain control of the room. Connect with your audience using some of the techniques I outlined earlier and keep going. After all, you are the person your audience came to hear. Hecklers can try to derail your progress, but you don't have to let them. In fact, it's good practice and a show of compassion to acknowledge other people's viewpoints in most situations. It's the way we learn from one another. Sometimes if someone is behaving rudely or in a nasty manner, they're simply hiding a certain amount of pain. And if we can uncover that pain and better yet help them deal with it, we might gain a staunch friend and ally. It won't always happen, but I've been surprised at how often it has. Belligerent clients. Sometimes the people you're about to work with have bees in their bonnets and they get downright rude or belligerent. Of course, if you feel unsafe, take precautions and get out of there. But if you believe you can diffuse the situation and still make it a win, you will need to act quickly to figure out what's making them act up. Were they interested in being the ones who did this themselves? You don't know what's gone on behind the scenes. It's possible this person wanted to make the speech or facilitate the workshop. If so, deputize them. Make them a partner in what you are all doing together, and they'll become your biggest fan. This works incredibly well with misbehaving students. I deputize the greatest troublemaker. I stress the importance of their task, and I give them my faith that they will succeed. In over 20 years of facilitating workshops for students of all ages, I have never had that technique fail. Do they think what you're doing is bunk? Take a minute and wow them. Find out what they want if you can and then give it to them until they're sated. Often, they don't want things to change too much. They just want to feel like they've had their say and made some sort of impact on the situation. These folks have a lot in common with hecklers, so make them feel important and maintain control of the situation and you will appease them. Additionally, if you can honor them and their wishes, even if you're only saying, I wish I could provide what you're asking for, that can soften an unyielding stance. In these cases, use your perception skills. For example, if what they want is praise, praise them for burping. If what they want is humor, make them laugh. Often, your clients will be under incredible pressure to succeed, to pull off an amazing event, and they might need something to break their tension and lower their stress level. A self-deprecating joke that helps them laugh can brighten the entire situation and make it feel more manageable to them and to you. Do you sense the issue has nothing to do with you or the event, but is something in their personal life? Dig deep and find your compassion and then proceed from that place. 
It can be super challenging to show compassion to someone who's being nasty, but if you can, you might reap amazing rewards and a connection that lasts far beyond this one occasion. I also recommend that you work with them to deal with the issue they raise with you. Regardless of what might be going on with them internally, resolving this issue will improve their current behavior and perhaps their state of mind. Are they exhibiting signs of stress? If so, remain calm. Look for others to work with to bring a peaceable resolution so you can all proceed. Remember, you're a pro. You don't have to put up with people who are being nasty. Having said that, you can also work with them to bring the threat level back down so you can all succeed. Only you can decide for yourself if it is worth it to you to remain and work on it. Is just one person throwing a wrench into the works? You will find that there are hierarchies in every group of people. There will be the main leader, and hopefully that person is on your side. There will also be factions. You will need to become adept at identifying those factions and figuring out who's the person everyone looks to for their information, ideas, and the lead on how to proceed. If you get that person on your side, or at least ready to collaborate with you, you will resolve the issues together and make everything fly. So whether it's hecklers, cranks, or a fuzzed out sound system, plan for everything to go wrong and prepare for it. Carry extras of everything you will need. Over rehearse what you will say until about three days beforehand, then stop and trust yourself to know it. The night before, look it over one last time right before you go to sleep. Where I come from, we do that and then we put the item under our pillow. I'm not saying you have to put your presentation under your pillow after your final read-through, but research suggests that if we peruse something right before we sleep, we will retain more of it the next day. That's how I memorized the entire multiplication table in one night and aced my test the following day. Be prepared to be flexible. Despite a client's best efforts, sometimes things on their end go wrong. Sometimes other people are late or run long and you will need to drastically shorten your part. That means you have to know your stuff so well that you can cut and rearrange chunks to suit shorter or longer time frames. I've struggled with this throughout my career. I can talk forever, but if you ask me to truncate things, I'll try to meet your needs, but I might panic, so I've learned to ask my audience what they want to hear about. It goes something like this. It turns out we have a little less time than I thought we would, I say. We're going to have 45 minutes together instead of an hour. So what do you think I should focus on? What would you like to talk about? Once I hear from them, I quickly mentally rearrange my notes and delete a few PowerPoint slides from my deck, and then we're off and running. Sometimes that means I don't get to do what I planned. Other times, I end up way out of my comfort zone. I view these times as adventures. Don't get me wrong. I do find them stressful, but I also find them fun. I treat this sort of fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants situation as a challenge. And truthfully, once I start and I'm in it, I forget that I'm out of my comfort zone. Instead, I enjoy the ride. Here's one of my best examples from my own life. Many of my readers and followers know that I have been a tarot card reader for over 35 years. Many people also know that I read palms. I do this for entertainment purposes at corporate events and other places because it helps me connect with people, tell stories, and communicate. There is no greater training for public speaking than reading for 40 different quote-unquote bosses at an event, connecting, being accurate, listening, and telling them their tales. It is amazing training, and I still do it every so often. While most people know my great-grandmother taught me how to read regular playing cards back in the Soviet Union, they don't know how I started doing palm readings. About 17 years ago, I took a corporate job at a lumber company down in Williamsburg, Virginia, doing tarot card readings for four hours. It was for a corporate holiday event, and I was going to have a table, chairs, and decorations. People would sit down and get their cards read. I drove the three hours down from Washington, D.C. and showed up to the lumber yard. The DJ at the event also happened to be the booking agent who had contacted my agent to get me to come down and do these readings. When I met her, I asked her where I was going to sit. Sit? She asked. We don't want you to sit. We want you to do walk around. For those who don't know, walk around is when you go up to the people around the venue and you entertain them with whatever skill they hired you to showcase. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do tarot card readings while doing walk around, I said. Generally, I need to be able to lay the cards out. I don't want you to do tarot card readings. I want you to do palm readings, she answered. What? I have a contract right here, I produced it. It doesn't say anything about palm readings, I said. I'm afraid there's been some mistake. I can't do palm readings tonight because I don't read palms. 
Well, you have to do something. The client wants palm readings. I'm sorry, I said. Literally, I don't know how to do them. I excused myself, exited the building, and called my agent. We have a problem. They want me to do palm readings. Why is that a problem, she asked. Because I don't know how to do them. Well, can you do anything? I don't know. I'll try, I said. This was long enough ago that I had a handspring trio. On it, I had a rudimentary palm reading app. I had been meaning to learn how to read palms, but I hadn't gotten around to it. So I went into the ladies' room and spent about 10 minutes learning the names of the various lines and mounds of the palm. I figured out which one was the lifeline, which one was the heart line, and which one was the headline. I figured out that the Jupiter mound had something to do with leadership and dynamic qualities. I figured out the Mars mound was about ethics and morals. I did the best I could to figure out what meant what. And then I put the little trio away, went out to the main room, and proceeded to kick butt reading palms for the next four hours. How did I manage? Sometimes I still wonder, but really the best answer for that is that I had done enough preparation and a sufficient number of readings that I knew how to read the people, their energy, and their lines without even needing to know consciously the actual names of things. Because I knew my other material so well, and because I was a practiced listener and communicator, I was able to take my knowledge and apply it to a different discipline. In the end, communication is about people, intent, emotion, and energy. If we can figure those out, we can make all the rest work. And I learned a valuable lesson about communication that night, which benefits me to this day. Nowadays, I make sure I get to speak to the clients directly. I no longer take anyone's word for anything. I make sure I get all the information firsthand. Otherwise, I feel I'm being irresponsible and not doing enough to fulfill my clients' needs. I never again want to be faced with a, What? You came here to teach us how to sing? We didn't want to learn how to sing. We wanted to learn how to twist balloon animals type of situation. I don't want to hear, we didn't want someone to teach us how to write really great stories. We wanted a magician. I know balloon animal twisters. I know magicians. If somebody came to me and said that's what they wanted, I would do my best to get them exactly what they wanted. When communication lines are blurred and you're playing a business version of the telephone game, you have to seek clarity. But even if you try your best and there is no clear path to the correct answer, you have to do what you can. We all have to be adaptable, flexible, and maneuverable in how we solve problems for people. Because, let's face it, that's what we do. We are all in the business of solving other people's problems. I hope you enjoyed Chapter 16 of Speak From Within, my book on how to engage, inspire, and motivate audiences. That was really fun. I love I love that story, honestly, about when I learned to read palms. It was wacky. I was terrified, but it turned out great. And the reason it turned out great is because they wanted me to read for the president of the company who poo-pooed. He thought all that stuff was boo-boo and poo-poo, and he just did not want it at all. And they convinced him to do it because they wanted to have palm readings. And they were like, you need to go read for him. And I took a look at him. I read him cold because, honestly, that's what I was there to do because I don't, I wasn't a palm reader at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. So I read him, told him stuff about himself he that I couldn't possibly have known. He was shocked and amazed. And I got booked for the next three years to do the same gig, which, <laughs> which was a delight for me, even though I had been so scared to begin with. Just goes to show, I guess, that fear plays a role, but it cannot stop us. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode and you can st- Stay tuned for next week's episode from the Speak From Within audiobook when we talk about Chapter 17, What's Your Problem? If you like the episode, I would love it if you would leave the show a review. It would mean the world to me, really, because it's it's a way for me to know what you're thinking. And if you do want to buy me a cup of coffee to keep supporting the podcast, I would love that, too. You can go to http colon slash slash buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And you know me, I like my lattes with a lot of oat milk. I would love it if you would support the show that way. Thanks so much. And until next time, I remind you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. 
Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.